Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I, Dr. Varun Suriya, Assistant Professor, Department of Oral and Exhibition Surgery, invites all of you to the CPC conducted by Department of Oral and Exhibition Pathology and Microbiology in collaboration with Department of Oral and Exhibition Surgery and Department of Radio Diagnosis. First of all, I would like to invite our mentor, Dr. Ajarov Chakri, sir, to initiate the proceedings with few words. Sir, so I would like to uh, introduce our speaker for clinical part, uh, Dr. Vidya Ratan. Sir has done his uh, graduation from Government Dental College, Patiala in 1989, MDS from the prestigious Nair Hospital Dental College in 1993. Sir has joined uh, PGI MAR in 1994. He is a professor of oral and maxi surgery at the PGI Chandigarh. He is also vice chairman Indian Board of Oral and maxi surgery. And sir is also editor in chief general of oral biology and clinical research. So I would like to request sir to start with the clinical discussion. Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be here for the prestigious gathering at the end New Delhi. So I have been given a case to discuss this 30 year old female who presented with chief complaint of swelling and numbness in the right lower region of the mandible which is there for almost 6 months. She was apparently well 6 months before when she noticed some swelling at the right lower front region and then she reported at a local government hospital with a small Sea tissue was taken and then she was referred to AIMS and she was operated here in December 25. Past medical history and family history are not contributory. General examination, there was no neurology deficit, all vitals are normal. There are no abnormality except for the swelling over the mandible. Coming to local examination, face was grossly symmetrical, there was small swelling which could be palpated with hand but couldn't be seen. There was no sensory deficit or lymphadenopathy, as well as the skin. All teeth were present and there is no information regarding mouth opening, mobility, tenderness and vitality of the teeth. This is a radiological picture which has been provided to me. This is orthopendomogram which shows this small lesion which is over the periapical area of premolars, canine and coming up to incisors. You see there is the battery bit. So, here, if you look at this, there is, you can see some, it is irregular, looks like some but loculated and you see some radial dense line, vertical boundary, which is not very distinct at some areas, which is indistinct, 
this mental nerve opening is equal size and there is no enlargement of the inferior alveolar the neurovascular bundle canal. This is orthopentomogram which has been made from CBCT, similar same area. There is an carious tooth here also. Another carious tooth, but this carious tooth is far away from the lesion and there is no pain or turbulence or sinus there. Similar looking swelling which we had earlier described. These are some cuts, axial cuts from the CBCT. This radial and osteolytic lesion is extending onto this lingual cortex going in between the roots of T and there is the root resorption head. Some irregular features there. You can see some locules. This is the opening of the mental nerve, hair opening of the mental nerve. Some locules you can see and there is some root resorption. In the coronal view also show some loculation, root resorption in osteolytic region with some areas with distinct border and sometimes it is irregular. Similarly, in other cuts, see some loculation there. This is the axial view of the CBCT. Again, same similar looking lesion, which is indenting this lingual cortex. So, just to summarize. 30 year old female presented with slowly growing swelling in her premolar or canine region of the mandible of 6 month duration. There is no pain, tenderness, prolence, due or trails which could be seen. Radiographically, irregular loculated radiolucent osteolytic lesion with root resorption over the anterior region of the mandible. So now coming to differential diagnosis, what it is. So any lesion can be described generally into developmental of lesion, inflammatory or neoplastic. Because this lesion had no pain and on radiograph these developmental cells look well corticated, well outlined. Heavy malformation, also, there are no way of cells. Idiopathic bone cavities are also well corticated, single, small inside, going in between teeth. So, these lesions can be easily ruled out. Inflammatory lesions also can be ruled out because there is no pain, tenderness, fast purulence, there is no signs of infection. So, microbiological causes, inflammatory causes can be. Most likely this region is of neoplastic region. Neoplastic can be benign or malignant. And when coming to mandible, these can be again odontogenic origin or of non-odontogenic. Further, these can be of epithelial, nasal thymal, or of mixed origin. So as looking at the picture and radiograph, it looks like a benign aggressive region. And according to our clinical experience and literature, myeloblastoma is the most common tumor affecting the mandible. Although it is more seen in the molar famous region, but anterior myeloblastoma are also very common. And there are various clinical and histological variants. I'll keep, I'll keep this at the top of the list. Then giant cell lesions or giant cell tumors are also very common in mandibular anterior region particularly in females but color these are brown in color but mucosa is looking normal 
other lesion which we commonly see in the anterior mandible are fibroma or non ossifying fibromas. These are well defined lesions well, and unilocular sometimes you see septa in between. Another lesion is myxoma, maybe odontogenic, non odontogenic lesion. You see a tennis racket appearance there where put septa are perpendicular to each other and thin septae. Other lesions which can be schwannoma or squamous odontogenic tumor, just to complete that is schwannoma, because it is near the mental nerve lesion, but these are well defined slow growing lesion with corticated borders. In malignancy, you have rat borders, rat root absorption. Looking at the radiology, chances of malignant lesions are less, but you do get surprises in mandibular pathologies. Various lesions can be carcinomas or malignant tumors of slavery gland lesions such as mitoid carcinomas and adenocarcinomas. Those have rack borders. Those will be accompanied with parasitia. Some pain, some features of malignancy will be there. Sarcomas like chondrogenic osteosarcomas or geomyosarcomas also do affect but there are no features of malignancy in the present case. Metastatic tumors from other side, most commonly from lung, breast, or renal cell carcinoma, also do get metastasized to the mandible. Other lesions of hematological regions like plasma cytoma, multiple myeloma, non Hodgkin lymphoma also do affect the mandible, but these are complete with other systemic features and paresthesia, etc. In our case, there is no feature suggestive of malignancy. Other lesions which can be histocyte related lesions like eosinophilic granuloma affecting the mandible. So, my most likely diagnosis will be benign recessive lesion, most likely amyloblastoma or its variant. Giant cell lesions, while taking biopsy, you come to know because it bleeds profusely and it is brown in color. And other lesions which we commonly see affecting the anterior mandible is ossified. So, I'll keep these in this order and that's it. So to confirm it, I will like to go for a biopsy. Will be done. Now. Thank you. Any questions? Comments? Anyone want to comment on the geology clinical feature? That was not provided. So thank you. Are there any other any other diagnosis from the audience? Uh, would the radiologist like to comment on the imaging? Now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Smita Manchandar, additional professor, Department of Video Diagnosis, Ames in Delhi, for the discussion of the radiological part. So a very good option to all. And uh, we have been provided with an OPG and a CBCT as has been uh, shown. Previously, yeah. 
So the, this is the OPG and we can see that there is a very fine multilocular radial lesion which has got irregular margins in the anterior mandible uh, to the right of the midline and it is in relation to the root of multiple teeth there is evidence of root resorption and uh, the lesion appears to be uh, slightly irregular even though multilocular. So on the basis of this uh, OPG, we can see that the lesion is in relation to the root of the teeth. It is very epithelial in location. It is above the level of the inferior alveolar canal. So likely an autogenic lesion, a lytic lesion and uh, almost in the anterior uh, mandible, right parameter. Uh, these are the representative CBCT images, the axial view the uh, coronal and the sagittal view and these are the volume rendered images of the same. So again we can identify that the lesion is predominantly lytic, it is a, as it was seen on the OPT as a radial lucent lesion. It is very apical in location. It was in relation to the root of multiple teeth and there was evidence of root resorption. There is evidence of cortical breach and there is evidence of uh, the lysis of the cortical margin along the gingival surface and also uh, slightly anteriorly. There is no definite matrix within this lesion, even though the lesion is having uh, some irregular center, which is giving it a multilocular appearance. These are the reconstructed uh, OBG images from the CBCT and the paraxial images. So, in the paraxial images, also we can better identify the root resorption and the multilocularity of the lesion, which is predominantly lytic. So, on the basis of the imaging, as we have seen, it is a well-defined lesion. It has got irregular margins. It is multilocular, radiolucent, and a periapical lesion, which is above the inferior alveolar canal. So, we are saying that it is an odontogenic lesion, and it is in the anterior part of the right hemimandible, adjacent to the mentum, not crossing the midline, and there is no particular matrix calcification or ossification. So, the, as the lesion is causing resorption of the roots of the adjacent teeth and there is focal erosion of the gingival cortex, we would like to keep the differential of a locally aggressive or doctogenic lesion. So, the uh, final impression would be a locally aggressive or doctogenic periapical radiolucent lesion and on the basis of these imaging findings, we would like to keep the differentials of a ameloblastoma and the possibility also of a hemangioma. The, uh, since it is a CBCT, we cannot really comment about the enhancement pattern or the soft tissue characterization of the lesion. So, I think we have to keep both these differentials in mind when we are further evaluating the lesion. Thank you. What about the eosinophilic granuloma? So, the uh, eosinophilic granuloma per se are usually well defined big lesions. They do not really have an irregular margin. Most of the lesions that we have seen are unilocular, not characteristically multilocular. And the location also is more in the uh, rings of the mandible as compared to the anterior midline. Thank you, ma'am. So, uh, patients' incisional biopsy was done outside AIMS and they have given a diagnosis of a protogenic tumor by Dr. Suraj from Oran and Special Surgery for their discussion regarding the surgical Yeah, so good afternoon everyone. Uh, so for this case who presented to us, uh, when we were required to plan the treatment, we had uh, many things in mind. So uh, to begin with, uh, when the treatment was planned, we had to identify whether it was malignant lesion or a benign lesion. So when it became out to be a Benign again, it was a locally aggressive lesion, so the treatment had to be planned likewise. So, um, so um, when the when the treatment was planned, so we planned an end block resection for this lesion because it was a locally aggressive lesion, and the, it was also associated with the root of teeth, namely of three one four one four two four three four four and four five. So all these te te uh, teeth had to be extracted as well, along with the bone which was involved in the lesion had to be taken out. So the end block resection was planned for this, and we did not uh, encounter any kind of uh, like segmental margin uh, of the segmental defect of the mandible because uh, it was not involved with the lower border of the mandible. So and also 
the lower part of the mandible was strong enough so it did not require any kind of reconstruction uh, for this case and so uh, during the surgery we took a cravicular incision because we had to take out the teeth as well and we bend in and a part of the bone uh, with safe margin of about 5 mm because uh, this local aggressivation can extend up to 4 mm beyond the, the uh, radiographical margins. So such a treatment was planned and after the, uh, the, uh, the bone was resected, the bone was resected and block along with the lesion, we closed the lesion, we closed the defect and the mucosal closure was actually done. And so this was the resected specimen, approximately 2.5 to 3.5 into 3.5 centimeter in, in dimension. And uh, this is how the post-operative orthopendomogram looked like. So the the, uh, the lesion had been taken out completely. The marginal, uh, the the mental foramen is preserved here. It is here. So the mental foramen was also preserved, and the patient was doing absolutely fine after the closure. We did not encounter any kind of dehiscence, uh, and the suture site and uh, the, the surgical site healed without any kind of complications and uh, thank you so much that's what that was about the surgical side so if there is any kind of clarifications required more I will do it thank you so much so any any questions or comments regarding the surgery thank you Dr. Suresh so now we'll begin with the histopathological diagnosis so this is the specimen we have received. It is uh, around 4 into 3 into 2 centimeter of right mandible. As you can see, centering sizes, between sizes, canine, first and second premolar. It was showing both buccal and <coughs> limbal perforation. And we have to cut it uh, in between to take out the pathological tissue. So this is the uh, histological slides of the patient. So let's let's see. So at the lower power view, what uh, what we can see is uh, some sort of uh, uh, cystic-like luminal species. You can uh, appreciate it here, like here, and here. And if we zoom in, the first thing we notice in this is the cuneiform architecture. This uh, pseudoductal species are uh, filled with the mucoid-like material. Let's give it as a cribriform pattern. Uh, and this, uh, if we zoom in further, we can see this uh, duct like spaces filled with mucoid material. And they are surrounded by cuboidal to columnar cells. At some places they are cuboidal, at other places they are columnar. If we zoom in further, at certain areas we can see that these cells uh, appear slightly columnar and they have hypochromatic nuclei, which is polarized away from the basement membrane. We can also see subnuclear vacuoles. Uh, along with that, uh, please look at other areas like this area. We can see some sort of uh, rosette or maroon formation in this area. You can see a circular arrangement of the pathological cells, or you can say concentric arrangement of the cells. This was present in some of this area. So, this is one presentation of this tumor. Now, if you look at other areas, okay, so now look at this area. Now here the cells are tall columnar, you can see the length of the cell, they are more in length than the width. So cells are tall columnar and they have a hyperchromatic nuclei which is polarized away from the basement membrane. We can uh, demarcate this, this is the basement membrane and they are polarized away and so that we can see sub uh, nuclear vacuolization here. So these are two different uh, uh, findings uh, seen in this case uh, which, uh, which may lead to confusion. This is one slide. Now let me show you other slides also. Okay, this is the second one. So again, this is very interesting now. See, now if you look at these areas, you can see uh, large follicular-like structures undergoing some sort of cystic degeneration. If we zoom in further, Again, we can appreciate that these large follicular or cystic like areas, they are surrounded by odontogenic epithelium. And very interestingly, they are showing you textbook like picture. I think most of us have seen these kind of images in our third year, maybe first year in our uh, subject of oral pathology per se. 
So again, very classical images, tall columnar cell, polarized away from basement membrane. These are certain criteria. Anyone wants to guess which criteria it fulfills from the audience? From which one? Chaha, because and growing criteria. Exactly. Okay. So then we can also see some sort of stellate reticulum like cells here. And this luminal area is mainly because of cystic degeneration. So they are showing large, large follicles of uh, odontogenic epithelium. The cells are looking like ameloblast type and they have number of large follicles. You can see this is one, one large follicle, one large follicle and then some small follicles can also be seen in the stroma like this one. See, small follicle and if you look at them, you know, they are extending into the stroma, surrounding stroma. You see the boundary of the lumen, uh, boundary of the follicle. They are extending into the stroma. So again, an indication of the aggressive behavior of the tumor. And you can see some sort of clear cell changes here. And again, look at this here. <clears throat> so now, this uh, foci of uh, odontogenic epithelium, it is infiltrating into the surrounding capsule. You can see, these are the strands of the epithelium. They are infiltrating into the uh, capsule. So if we look at only this area, you know, cystic uh, lumen-like areas surrounding by this uh, odontogenic epithelium and it is showing the uh, neural proliferation inside the capsule. So varied appearance is seen in this case. So let's look at the third uh, slide. So this is the third, third slide of this. Again a quite similar, uh, again a quite similar picture. Again you can see some sort of capsule. You, know, you can see, see this uh, sort of capsule which is lined by odontogenic epithelium having a cystic lumen. If we enlarge again, it shows these pseudoductal spaces filled with mucoid material surrounded by odontogenic epithelium, giving it as a uh, cupiform pattern. So these are two prominent uh, different uh, sort of patterns are visible in this slide, uh, both of them favoring two different types of tumor. So now we will discuss uh, the differential diagnosis. Any question regarding this, these three slides? Some, uh, here and there some minor classification are seen along with some host cell mitotic figures are also there and you can also see some part of degenerated bone on the periphery of the tumor again it can be an indication of the aggressive uh, behavior of the tumor apart from that there was mild inflammation in the stroma and some sort of hemorrhagic areas are also seen not very clearly visible but they are there yeah. Just to summarize, these are the histopathological images. So we have seen this uh, kind of uh, cupiform arrangement of the tumor cells. They are ductal structure filled with mucoid material surrounded by a capsule and they also have a tumor like structure. And these are the modules or the nodules in which the odontogenic epithelium are arranged in a circular fashion with the surrounding uh, ductal expresses. And some ghost cell formation is also seen in these surrounding areas. And this is the classical uh, ameloblast-like cells. And we can also see uh, sub-epithelial hyalination in this area. You can see the, uh, this is the epithelium, this is the basement membrane, and below the basement membrane you see a very homogeneous area. So I think there are a number of clues uh, in these slides. So the differential diagnosis, is the, as the cell suggested, the most common differential diagnosis is obviously the ameloblastoma, then AOT, adenoid cystic carcinoma, DGCT, Adenoidermoblastoma, which is a new entity, and CEOT with AOT like areas. We will discuss them one by one. So, first of all, the most common tumor in this location is ameloblastoma. You can see these follicles. I have shown you in our scanned slide, there are a number of large, large follicles were present, and the follicles uh, are only, uh, more commonly seen in uh, cases of ameloblastoma. So, uh, it's a very common, uh, one of the most common tumor of the jaws. You can see islands or if, uh, islands of odontogenic epithelium. So, and now they can show different different patterns. They are different uh, histological subtypes of this tumor. We, they, we can have follicular patterns. We can have plexiform pattern. We can have acanthomatous, dysmoplastic, granular, and uh, uh, 
से मॉस ठीक सो ओके इट विल नॉट जूम इन so what we can see here again they are follicles which are lined by tall columnar cells fulfilling the wickers and golling criteria in the center we can see some sort of filler cell changes or some sort of cystic degeneration the nucleus are palisaded hypochromatic with reversal of polarity and we can see some sort of loose stellate reticulum like cells no subtle logical activity uh, now in our case although we had the follicles but we also had the cribriform pattern duct like spaces which were not seen in this case number one second uh, there is no cytological atp are commonly seen in case of homeoblastomas but in our case we have found some mitotic figures some ghost cells are there pillar cells are there and dendrite formation was also seen so that's why we can easily rule out the homeoblastoma next uh, uh, differential diagnosis is adenomatoid odontogenic tumor now this is the histological picture now this tumor is very a uh, very uh, classical in appearance uh, it is uh, encapsulated surrounded by a thick capsule and it is commonly associated with an unerupted impacted tooth commonly maxillary canine and mandibular premolars which were not seen in our case so also on the clinical basis we can rule out this tumor then this tumor shows uh, solid uh, epithelial nodules which can show some cystic areas or which can show rosette formation duct like structures can also be seen so on this basis we can rule out aot because there is no follicular areas and uh, clinically also it was not associated with the impacted tooth then the third differential is adenoid cystic carcinoma why we have kept this differential because on the outset you will see a very well nicely cribriform pattern so you can see these all you know duct like structures giving it a cribriform pattern <coughs> so it's a major it's, it's found in major and minor salivary glands nuclear hypochromatic angulated nuclei in our case nuclei were not similar to this okay in our case the nuclei were palisaded in most of the areas now there is a mixture of tubular cribriform patterns solid patterns can also be seen in these cases and very commonly the classical feature of acc is perineural invasion which was not seen in our case so there was no perineural invasion in our case so again we can rule out uh, adenocystic carcinoma and then dentigenic ghost cell tumor dcct again this tumor is very common in posterior regions of both the jaws it's a solid tumor basically uh, it can have conventional ameloblastoma like epithelium <laughs> but there is a plenty of ghost cells in all the all these areas you are seeing these all homogeneous looking areas it's a image at a low resolution i i can't zoom in but still we can appreciate here these all these are ghost cells and there is a abundant of ghost cell as the name suggests dentigenic ghost cell tumor dcct so it's contain lot of ghost cells which were not seen in our case although there are few ghost cell changes but it it's not in that abundance which are seen in dcct so again we can easily rule out our uh, dcct from our diagnosis then the next one is adenoid ameloblastoma now this this tumor have a different type of uh, uh, histological pattern Uh, it can show ameloblastoma like component uh, what we have seen in our case the follicles were there with tall columnar cells then along with that it can show duct like structures you can see this duct like structures here 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 and then again swirls and modules the circular arrangement of the odontogenic epithelium then we can have dentinoid clear cells and focal ghostly contention so <clears throat> looking at all the differentials now uh, according to audience which can be the most likely diagnosis in this case anyone want to make any comment regarding this so all these features were seen in our case in our case there was follicles uh, they were cribriform pattern they were dentinoid clear cells were there so although we have make our mind regarding diagnosis but to further confirm our diagnosis we have proceeded with the molecular analysis and we have gone for a bref mutation now bref mutation is commonly seen in case of ameloblastomas now you can see this is the patient sample this p stands for patient sample and you can see that there is no mutation in the bref it is showing wild type of bref band so bref mutation was absent in this case which was commonly seen in case of ameloblastomas so definitely we can say it's not a case of ameloblastoma so looking at all the clinical findings histological findings and definitely the finding of molecular analysis we come to our final diagnosis of adenoid ameloblastoma 
Now one of the major concern with this case is that this case can show lot of recurrences. According to WHO, it can show up to 75% of recurrences, but there is no recurrence in our case uh, since December 2014. Now this is a new entity. It has been called by different names in the past. So let's uh, discuss the uh, review of literature regarding this case. So how to define this uh, this uh, tumor? So in the older literature, you will find it is called by different name like hybrid hybrid tumor, mixed tumor, collision tumor. So it's basically a hybrid odontogenic tumor. It will show patterns of AOT and amyloblastoma. And uh, around 40 to 50 uh, cases are reported uh, in the literature. Our department have around four cases of this tumor, including this one. So it's not a very, very common tumor to, uh, to say, uh, and very less cases are reported in literature. And only I have found only one large case series. Otherwise, we will see only case series of four to five cases. So here lies the problem of classification because it is showing uh, uh, histological features of AOT also, amyloplastoma also, it is slightly aggressive also, it shows a lot of recurrence also. So according to old nomenclature in the old articles, it was uh, represented as hybrid combined mixed of pollution tumors. So better to classify adenoid amyloblastoma as a subtype of conventional amyloblastoma or as a separate entity. That is the main uh, question and a lot of uh, authors have raised this query in their articles uh, before the recent classification of WHO. So, so in the recent classification of WHO which was published I think in 2022 in the Adenoid Tumor 5th edition. They have mentioned antidoid amyloblastoma as a separate entity. We can see uh, different types of amyloblastoma like unicystic, extra osseous, conventional. And uh, after that, they have mentioned adenoid amyloblastoma as a separate entity. Now, why they have, they have classified it as a separate entity. This we will learn through this uh, review of literature. So let's discuss about the clinical features, what I've mentioned in the literature. So it's a, it's a tumor which is found more commonly in adults. 76% of cases are found uh, between 25 to 55 years of age. Uh, slight female prediction, although ratio is uh, almost similar. 64% uh, occurs in the mandible and within the both jaws, the posterior part of the jaw is the more commonly involved. So this is the imaging. Uh, uh, very uh, interestingly, it is uh, it's showing the radio lucid lesion, but also it can show mixed radio dense uh, appearance in some of the cases maybe because of dentinoid now margins now this is very important uh, because it can show ill defined margins with cortical perforation that's why it shows a lot of recurrences so in ar around 50 percent of cases the margins are ill defined with cortical perforation now histopathological findings so as we have discussed both the features of amyloblastoma as well as aot so amyloblastoma has uh, different histological patterns like plexiform, uh, follicular, but in this uh, entity, 70% of the pattern is of plexiform type. And similarly, the duct-like structures were the commonest uh, feature in accordance with the AOT and it's observed in around 90% of cases. And similarly, more than 90% of tumor can show uh, dentinoid formation, which is because of the inductive changes. <laughs> so again, Plexiform is the most common type. Follicular pattern can also be seen, but it can also show mixed type, which contain all the pattern like plexiform, follicular, granular, and desmoplastic. Now, this kind of tumor becomes very difficult to diagnose because it, they are showing different different patterns. And uh, surprisingly, it can also show unicystic uh, variant. Two cases are reported in which we have unicystic type of adenoid amyloblastoma. Now, features of AOT, glandular structures, epithelials, and rosette formation can be seen. The most common is glandular structures and dentinoid formation is seen in according to WHO they are seen in 75% of cases but in this uh, review they have found in all the cases. So there are some essential and uh, desirable criteria given by WHO for the diagnosis of this particular entity. Essential criteria are amyloblastoma like component which was seen in our case. Second is duct like structure which again was seen in our case. Then also modules again and reform architecture. So our case was fulfilling all the essential criteria of adenoid amyloblastoma. 
So again, this is a image taken from WHO website. It is showing this classical cuneiform patterns. You can see duct-like structures, and again, these uh, modules or rosette forms here and there. Then we can also see some sort of focal go cell catenization. This, these are the cells. Go cells means the boundary will remain uh, intact, and it is filled with creatin. You can see this uh, cells are filled with creatin. And uh, these are showing this dentinoid formation uh, alongside the odontogenic epithelium. So these are the essential criteria. Then there are certain desirable criteria which can support our diagnosis. Dentinoid, it was seen in our case. Pillar cells were also seen, and also focal gross cell So all the essential and desirable criteria were fulfilled in our case. Uh, apart from this case, we have three more cases of adenoidal blastoma. Which are showing all the essential and desirable factors. Now, as far as the treatment goes, since uh, this uh, uh, this tumor can show high return rate, so it has been uh, treated by conservative excision, radical excision, and some of the some of the surgeons uh, facilities have tried radiotherapy in this case also, uh, and it is given after the repairs. So, as far as the prognosis goes. AA that is adenoidal blastoma is a locally infiltrative tumor with a high recurrence rate up to 70% and this this is according to WHO. Now there are certain features like cyt uh, cytological atypia, hypercellularity, P53 positivity and high uh, KI67 indexes. Uh, they can be seen in cases with high recurrences but where this tumor ends and where the carcinoma begins the borderline between the benign tumor and the odontogenic carcinoma is not yet well defined. So IHC, so it shows variable staining for different markers like CK14, 19, P40, P16, and P53. Uh, CK7 is weak to negative as expected. Uh, nuclear beta catenin positivity can be seen within the modules. And obviously, since it shows a lot of mitotic figure, so CHI 67 indexes are usually high. Now we can perform this kind of IHC test to find out whether the tumors are aggressive or not. Now, uh, malignant transformation has not been reported in any of the cases in the adenoidoblastoma till date. So, adenoidoblastoma seems to be more aggressive in behavior supported by high number of recurrences as compared to conventional amyloblastoma. Even conventional blastoma can show the recurrences, but it shows more recurrences as compared to the conventional amyloblastoma. So, molecular findings. Now, WHO has classified uh, this as a separate entity based on different different findings. Molecular finding is one of them. So, AOT in amyloblastoma have uh, mutations in MAPK pathway. 70% uh, of AOTs have KRAS mutations, whereas BRAF is the most common mutations found in the amyloblastoma. So, if it belongs to either amyloblastoma or either AOT, it must have shown these kind of mutations, but these mutations are absent in case of adenoid amyloblastoma. So, this is one study performed by Cora et al. <coughs> they have studied nine cases and they have tried to find out the mutations in BRAF and KRAS in case of adenoid amyloblastoma. This WT stands for wild type. So, there is no mutation, they have found no mutation in BRAF and KRAS in all the cases of adenoid Now, after amyloblastoma and AOT are out of picture, a further challenge lies in distinguish it from the amyloblastic carcinoma, since both of them can show hypercellularity and variable ATP. Sometimes uh, we can uh, see high degree of ATP, loss of amyloblastic differentiation, necrosis. Now, whenever we see this kind of finding, the diagnosis goes more towards the amyloblastic carcinoma as compared to the uh, adenoid amyloblastoma. And also vascular and infection. So these are the findings which we'll see in amyloblastic carcinoma. And again, recently a novel malignant uh, odontogenic neoplasm are described as odontogenic carcinoma with dentinoid, that is OCD. Now, although there are some overlap, OCD can show some overlap with our adenoid amyloblastoma. It appears that OCD does not show the classical appearance uh, of A, that is. Uh, our adenoid arrangements or the cuneiform pattern. Now, 
Additionally, apart from these tumors, AA can also harbor similarities with DGCT, but they can be easily distinguished because DGCT will, will show a lot of bow cell foci. Now, DGCT and autonomic carcinoma with dentinoid harbor CT and then B1 mutations, which are similar to other lesions which are rich in host cells like COCs. So, mutation in CT and then B1 genes, which are related to WNT pathway, they are not common in amyloblastoma. So, they are separate entity from the amyloblastomas. So, again, this study was performed by Bastos et al. and they have found uh, six out of nine cases have shown mutation in CT and then B1 mutations and no mutation in BRAF and KRAS. So, according to them, uh, adenoid amyloblastoma does not show mutation in BRAF and KRAS, this we already know, but it shows mutations in CT and in B1 genes. So, just a second. Yeah. So, 6 out of 9 cases of mutation, 3 cases does not show mutations. So, is there any difference in the histological findings between the cases which show mutations and which does not show mutations? The answer is uh, no. There is no microscopic differences in case of adenoid amyloblastoma between the tumors which were showing mutations and between the tumors which does not show mutations. Now, both OCD and amyloblastoma can show certain histological similarities which can lead to confusion like dentinoid material, presence of clear cells. Now, these findings suggest that both of these OCD and adenoid amyloblastoma they belong to the same molecular driver that is WNT signaling pathway and they could represent the benign and malignant counterpart. What I mean to say is that adenoid amyloblastoma represents the benign counterpart of the autogenic carcinoma with dentin, which is obviously malignant. Now, OCD show pathogenic mutations in CT and in B1 genes and strong beta catenin accumulation in the nuclei consistent with the WNT signaling pathways. So, in summary, CT and in B1 mutations occurs in case of adenoid glioblastomas. And this finding supports the possibility of a relationship with of AA with autogenic carcinoma with dentinoid and other uh, tumors containing host cell like DGCT. So, to conclude, molecular evidence suggests, molecular evidence means the BRAF and the KRAS mutations were absent, whereas CT and NB1 mutations were present. So, they suggest that adenoid amyloblastoma is genetically distinct from amyloblastoma as an AOT and supporting its classification as a separate entity. So, at the end, I would like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Vidyatan sir for the clinical discussion, our chief ma'am, Dr. Ridhu Dudal. Our mentor, Dr. Ajay Chaudhary, Dr. Ashu Sethi Bhalla, Dr. Smita Manchinda, Dr. Achal Kapka, Dr. Jain Kumar, Dr. Tripika Mishra, Dr. Soham, and Dr. Suraj. Thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, no, sir. We are not. Yes. So we are planning to wait, but. Uh, Yes, We have uh, uh, so the uh, 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 Thank you, sir. So, now that the annoying of the customer was more than the usual customer, so 
and my hair is a little stain and I'm not up to this right now. Uh, it's almost, almost a year that it's not regret, but uh, it's not a little bit more. So that's his uh, species. I think we follow that regularly, 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 and uh, with the most uh, initial signs of regrets, uh, the decision has to be done on the species. However, uh, what, what we do is that uh, although we have taken care of the same margins of uh, of uh, five million years or so, which is, it can be more with amino customers actually. But uh, what we do is that we use uh, or noise specific solutions, uh, uh, which is used in the European analysis mostly, and that fixates the amino cells. And we have seen that there are less differences, and we also have a systematic review of amino cells. It is a bit that the MRI solution also works in the coronavirus uh, system. But uh, this case needs to be followed up nearly at least for 10 years. I mean, what would happen to the detect? How will it happen to the detect? Is it online to be seen? It's too obvious to say that. Yeah, so, so uh, as you see that, uh, on the other side, uh, there's a book on the network feed. So there should not be any issue with the chain. But uh, this defect heat up, uh, this uh, defect of the surgery heat up, I've seen it in the course of the way. And uh, uh, I, I don't know, but we can hear it from the patient's who support this treatment. So regarding treatment part, should this be treated separately from endoglass or at least we almost one centimeter margin for natural endoglass? Sir, the treatment we can run in the same way, but we have to look out for recurrences because you can show high recurrences. Your recurrences will depend on marking. Sir, it also depends on the, uh, the genetic variable. Yes, sir. They were safe. It was clear or? It was clear, sir. Yes. Sir, so, so the recurrence was not detected by the surgeon. Thank you, everyone, for coming to the CPC. Uh, and we would like to thank Sir Dr. Vidaratan, sir. Now I invite the Dr. Uh, thank you everyone and I am really uh, fortunate uh, that Dr. Vidaratan sir accepted our offer and he came on the way to, uh, to be a part of this uh, very interesting CPC and uh, so we will be looking forward to having more and more of such Thank you so much and thank you all the faculties and uh, your students to being a part of this. Thank you.